This is such a pleasure, Professor, uh, to have you with us. Thank you so much for finding time, despite uh, traveling throughout the world. Uh, we, we very much appreciate uh, you uh, finding a moment to speak about um, your last uh, book. Um, but before we got there, we go there. Uh, let me let me do a brief introduction. Um, although I'm sure it's 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 absolutely not needed. Uh, nevertheless, um, Professor Bartov, Omer Bartov, is, is no doubt one of the, the leading uh, experts and scholars in the fields of uh, Holocaust, but also in the subject of uh, Jewish uh, Galicia. And, and throughout his work, he has been um, deconstructing uh, myths and, and uh, offering new insight into uh, both um, involvement of, of the German army, uh, Wehrmacht, into the Holocaust and other crimes that uh, he uh, in his books uh, about Wehrmacht and, uh, and Eastern Front, but also uh, in his recent books, um, deconstructing myths and, and offering unique insight into the interactions uh, between the Germans, Ukrainians, ethnic Poles and Polish Jews during the Holocaust, on on a case study of a of a small town, uh, which which uh, used to be in the eastern Poland, uh, in Galicia, and today is in in Ukraine, and you will all know the name of of this town, and uh, it will be coming back uh, coming back many times during this meeting. Uh, and the name of the town is uh, Buchach, and uh, and this is because of this this town, or actually because of again the, the latest book of Professor Bartov. We are all uh, here today. So if you haven't read Tales from the Borderlands, uh, Making and Unmaking the Galician Past, I would highly recommend um, that. Um, we would love to uh, make it possible for Professor Bartok to sign copies, uh, uh, but maybe next time if we'll be able to bring Professor to Krakow to the Galicia Jewish Museum. But if, if you don't have a book, we will post the link uh, and that will allow you to buy the book directly from uh, the website of the Galician Galicia Jewish Museum. Um, all right, uh, Professor, uh, are we ready? Yes, uh, I'm ready, and thank you so much for organizing this event and for hosting me. The pleasure is is, is all all uh, ours. Um, so, so again, I, I'll be. Uh, I, I read this book uh, having in mind the previous book. Uh, which 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 you which you wrote uh, on Buchach, um, uh, and and the anatomy of, of genocide, and um, I find the the, the tales uh, very surprising in many ways. I mean, most of all, uh, first of all, the, the book uh, I found this book being very personal, at the times almost poetic, uh, and again in, in uh, this respect different from from your previous book uh, on on, on Buchach, which was uh, of course again a groundbreaking in a way that it it changed our understanding of this of those social dynamics in in, in this uh, on the case study of, of this small town on the borderlands of, of, of former Poland um and uh, and I was the, the first question I'd like I'd like to ask is is what made you to to, to return to to Buchach? Well, thank you. Yes, and I, I I think it is a very different book. I'm I'm first of all happy about it because it's it's very sad if you keep writing the same book as can happen to some scholars. So um, I I'm I always try to write something that is different, uh, both for my own interests and for the interests of others. Um, but it's also different in in a, in an interesting sense for me that. When I was, you know, I spent about 20 years uh, studying this region, studying Buchach, Galicia, and um, I ended up in about 2017 with enormous drafts of various chapters that I had written that could in no way uh, be included in a single book. Uh, and I realized that I actually had done two things. One was a text which became Anatomy of a Genocide, which was very much a book about the trajectory towards genocide. That is, what is the point at which a, a community of coexistence becomes a community of genocide? So there was a particular trajectory to that book. The first part tries to see how we got there, 
and the second part tries to see what happened while this event was occurring on the local level. But the other chapters were not about that at all. The other chapters, which didn't fit into that book, were about the world that existed before all that began. And that world uh, needed, I thought, to be understood and to have its own story be told. It was not a world that knew that at the end of that history, genocide would come, uh, popul populations would be, so to speak, unmixed uh, in, in a huge explosion of violence. It was a world that had its own logic, its own beauty, its own difficulties, its own creativity. And so I wanted to tell the story of that world. Uh, but to tell that story, I needed some kind of, I'd say, analytical prism, or at least some kind of perspective. And that perspective was what I call first person history, because it was a very complex world and very different from the one that we live in now. I thought that I could tell that story through the myths and the legends and the stories, the biographies, the legends being told by the people who were there. And in order to do that, I felt also that I needed to have my own connection to that world. So in writing this kind of first person history, I felt also, if you like, implicated in that world. And my point of connection, which is at the beginning of the book and the end of the book, is that my own family, my mother came from there. And that at the beginning of this entire process, many years ago in 1995, I had some insight into it through her stories of her childhood there. So in that sense, it's personal on two levels. It's obviously personal for me, but I did not live in that world. I was born after it was all over, but still my mother's connection to it gives me this sort of, you know, uh, entry into it and personal in the sense of uh, telling a first person history, the history told through the people who lived there. Thank you. And, and, and you know, it's, it's the, the history uh, you, you're explaining uh, very early in the book that the, the, the book is precisely about the, the history, uh, the, in a way, micro history of men and women. Yes, you, you write uh, who, who, who lived in that universe of the borderlands, their fates and, and hopes and, and, and the stories that they tell, because every and you know, each and one of us uh, is, is, is telling our own people, uh, our own stories. Uh, even if, if it's a shared story, it's being described in, in, in many different ways uh, often. Uh, so, so what are those stories? I mean, how the, the, the Galicia is being described uh, mm -hmm. in Israel or uh, throughout the uh, memory of others that, that once lived there? So, you know, I mean, it's, it's obviously a very complex and multifaceted story. Uh, what I try to do in order to somehow organize it, um, I use a number of, of, of um, uh, rules, if you like, or categories. Uh, first of all, I, I did not tell the story of the entire borderlands because that's impossible. Uh, this was this huge area that begins in the Baltics and goes all the way down to the Black Sea and the Balkans. And obviously, I could not do that. I chose Galicia. Uh, and even within Galicia, there is a focus. It's not a total focus, but there is a pretty large focus on Buchach and the surrounding areas. So I had to limit it geographically. But then the other principle that I used was I tried to think about it as a world into which people came, right? These borderlands were formed by people who arrived there from various places. And so who were the people who came and what stories did they tell themselves and others about where they came from? These are tales of origins. So this is the kind of first trajectory that I look at. It's coming into the place. And because these are highly mixed areas, then different people, different ethnic groups, 
um, people of different religions, of different traditions, tell different stories of origin. Uh, and that is the, the, the beginning, if you like, of this world. It's like you tell a life, right? The life has to begin someplace. And, and you tell the story of where that life began. The second is what became of those people when they finally come there and they create a civilization, a culture that is both their own, that is related to how they see themselves, but in many ways it's informed by all those others because they are living there together. These are culturally mixed, ethnically mixed communities and they keep learning from each other. They, they don't always live harmoniously, but they live together. And so what became of them? And then the third part is about where they left because this world does not exist anymore. Today, as people living in what is now West Ukraine know, most of West Ukraine is populated mostly by Ukrainians. The Poles are gone, the Jews are gone. So this world has changed. So where did these people go? So these are stories of what happened to those people. Uh, and in the last part of the book, I tell, I personalize it. And I talk about how my own family transitioned from Galicia, from Buchach to Palestine. And how through that story, I try to both personalize it in the sense of what had been and what was lost, but also to, if you like, complicate the story of rescue. Because the people, Jews who left those parts of the world, like my family in the mid 1930s, they survived. Those who, let, who, who stayed behind, uh, most of my family, my, my extended family were murdered. No one came up, not a single person. Uh, and so you could tell the story as a story of you know, great premonition, of great wisdom. They left at the right moment. They, they took the right decision. But that's not the way they saw it, and that's not the way they experienced it at all. Transition, like all transitions, immigration is difficult. It's often um, something that tears you apart from your culture, from your family, and you will never regain that. That's something you may have survived because of it, but you have lost your family, your memories, the landscapes that formed you, the traditions, the languages, it's all gone. So I tell the story as a story also of a very painful transition. So those who left, left to what they believed would be a better world. Uh, they might have wanted to change it, uh, but the, the departure was a very painful one, quite apart from those who stayed behind. And that story, of course, is not told in this book, but in the previous book. Uh, so in that sense, that's the kind of, uh, trajectories that I follow in the book. And in each of them, I can choose, if you like, particular stories that I think may, be, may give a taste of what is in the book. Mm -hmm. um, yes, yes, because um, in, in the book, um, you, you have selected uh, certain characters, uh, historical uh, characters, uh, uh, who are becoming uh, our guides uh, throughout uh, certain moments of, of the history. Some of them are well known, like uh, uh, writer Agnon, but some of them are less known. Some of them are Jewish, some of them are not Jewish. Um, what was the process of, of, of the, that, that, uh, that led you to pick those, um, those people uh, and not the others? Well, that's, um, I, I, I can't claim to have, um, you know, um, um, have had a particular process in selecting them. What interested me most was people who I knew something about who told really interesting, uh, often I'd say uncharacteristic stories about the past who gave us insight into that world. So. Uh, when I tell, for instance, the story of origins, right? Uh, so one story of origins is told by someone that some uh, Polish readers might know, uh, people who 
do you particularly in Galicia, Sadok Baranch? Most people don't know who he was, but you know, he was a priest of Armenian origin. Uh, he lived in that area all his life. Um, he wrote in the second part of the 19th century, histories of different towns. And among those, he, he wrote a history of Buchach. And his story of the town and how it was formed is fascinating. And quite a few of the documents he cites no longer exist because between his writing and the present were many wars and a great deal of destruction. So archives were destroyed, libraries were destroyed. But he tells a story of origin, which is very much a Polish Catholic story. And it's also, if you like, a colonial story of how the Poles came to those parts of the world to civilize them. They built cities, they brought culture, and they fended off the barbarians. They fended off the Cossacks, they fended off the Tatars, they fended off the Ottomans. Uh, and they were creating the Crescent. They were creating this uh, borderland civilization. So I thought that, that his story was very telling, not only in that he tells his story, but that there is still, I believe to this day in Poland, a certain kind of nostalgia to that world. Uh, and he was writing it. He was writing that nostalgia just as, um, as, as Sienkiewicz was, was, was writing it in, in his great trilogy on, on the wars of the 17th century. Uh, but Baranchi is of that time himself, and, and he's also a believer, and he's much more, I would say, of a patriot uh, than, Shink than Shinkiewicz was. Um, the other story told by Agnon of Origins is a completely different story. It's, on the one hand, it's totally invented. Um, that is, for him, the people who founded Buchach, the origin of the city, is a caravan of Jews that came from the Rhineland and then came to these wild forests, was hosted by local lords who were hunting, who looked very fierce to those Jews from the Rhineland. And then the lords who host them over winter to protect them from the cold and the wild beasts discovered that the Jews are actually good for them because they start establishing commerce. They, they create an urban environment which is the one that becomes Buchach. So it's invented, but it's not entirely invented because the, the story of the, uh, of the arrival of Jews in those parts of Eastern Europe, Eastern first Poland and Eastern Poland, Ukraine, is actually that the great lords of the manors there as Poland or Polish Lithuania expanded into these areas, indeed invited Jews from Central Europe to develop the cities. So he personalizes that story into his own beloved Buchach, the city in which he was born and about which he actually wrote his entire career. Uh, and so you have two men who tell two totally different stories. They are stories of a love to a place. They are partly fabulous inventions and partly they are actually also historical. Uh, so for me, this was one example of how Different narratives were being told of how we came there, what, why we were there, uh, and they have a longer trajectory going beyond the time in which they were told in the sense that when nationalism comes to, this part, to these parts, then the question of ownership of the place comes up in the late 19th century. Who belongs to the place and to whom does this place belong? And in Agnon's story, the Jews were in transition. The Jews who founded Buchach or founded the cities uh, did not come to stay. They were on the way to Palestine. They were on the way to the Holy Land. They just stopped over for a night. The night lasted 400 years, but they really were on the way elsewhere. And eventually, as in his own story, when he was 21 years old, it ends up by them leaving and going to where they were always supposed to be. Whereas the Poles and the Ukrainians argue, this is our land and they have it out. And that's of course, the story also told in Anatomy of a Genocide. Hmm. Yes, and, and you've mentioned a few um, 
keywords or 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 a few ideas that are extremely important not only because of the the past it's not that uh, we've been we stopped reinventing this this particular space or or we stopped looking for proofs of ownership of that particular space i'm talking about uh, the, the 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 east the the the, the so called cresce yes um, it, it's still uh, the case. I mean, we're still reinventing, reimagining this space, and it's true um, both for the Poles, who uh, for whom this is a, a, a space that is in a sort of magical, uh, the, the parts of the land that used to be Poland, and we dream about them <clears throat> in a very nostalgic way. But then, when we go there, we are surprised to see that this space. It has been taken over by by others that that who that the strangers who built their own world on the rubbles of 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 our past and and this is also the case of 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 the Jews or who 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 have the same I think or similar feelings um, to to uh, to what we feel um, so, so so what is this this relationship uh, um, today. Uh, not not from the Sienkiewicz, so so 19th century, let's say, but how does relationship look today of the present day modern Israelis used toward that particular space? Oh well, that's uh, that's that's a whole other story, of course, and a very interesting one. So, you know, as long as this area was under communist rule and 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 was difficult to access. Um, um, there, there, there was not much travel there. But once the communist rule ended, uh, there have been many nostalgic uh, journeys to this area. Uh, they are complicated in the sense that people go to a land that has been, you know, 80 years have passed, uh, they come to a land that has been developed differently in which people, mostly Ukrainians, live, and they largely don't see it. What they see is what they look for. The, what they see are the non, no longer existing Jewish communities. And in, um, I can say for myself, and I've never joined any of those trips, I went under different circumstances, but when I came for the first time to Buchach, uh, which I had hoped to go to with my mother, but then my mother became ill and passed away. So I went for the first time in 2003, and I wanted to see what was it that, say, my grandfather remembered with much fondness, and my mother remembered as a childhood, a, a good childhood there. And when I came there, there was no sign of there ever having been Jews there. Uh, there was nothing. And when I started looking a bit further, then I discovered, say, that towns like Buchach are surrounded by mass graves, but these graves are not marked. And so you could say the Jewish community is there, but it's in mass graves, unmarked graves. And so the, in, in Buchach, there was no, the synagogue was destroyed by whatever was, was left of it, of it was destroyed by the Soviets after they took over in 1944. But in some other towns, say in Zhezhane or in Brode, synagogues were left, but they were left as empty house. And you could see over successive visits how they were falling apart. So there is this kind of sense of absence in your memory, in what you read, it's not your own memory, of course, it's the memory that was given you by others. It's a vicarious memory. You remember a civilization, when you come there, you see it in your mind's eye, but it is not what is actually there, but nature is there. And, you know, I, I remember personally uh, that I was driving, by car from Potok's water to Buchach on a country road. And I was thinking my great grandfather who used to travel from Potok's water to Buchach used to travel on that road. It's still the same road. It, it was a beautiful June day, you know, uh, nature was blossoming, winter was over. And I could think, you know, 
uh, it, I might have still been living there had history turned out differently. And so I, I felt something about the beauty of the place. And uh, so not only nostalgia, but also a kind of empathy with the nature, with the, with the beauty of the landscape. Uh, but all these things are, are complicated by the history. Uh, the history of murder, the history of of erasure of whatever there was. Um, and I would say that um, in the last few years, I mean, when I went there for the first time, it was, uh, it was difficult for me and um, it was melancholy. Uh, but over the last few years, before this horrible war broke out, uh, there were growing attempts by especially young people in those areas to try and re-remember, to find signs, to create some kind, not just of commemoration, but of a memory of the world that had existed before. Uh, and I found that very moving and very, uh, it filled, with, filled me with hope because when you look back, and I know that as, a, as, as someone who was raised in Israel, uh, in, at the time, never looking back, never remembering where we came from. When you don't remember wh where you came from or, or what there was before you, you have a very shallow identity. You have nothing to fall back on but your own birth, which is not such an interesting event. Uh, and so that attempt to look back at the world that existed before World War II despite all the denials, despite all the maybe guilt, maybe discomfort, enriches you, enriches the world you live in. And there were the, the beginnings of that uh, in Buchach and in other towns, certainly in Lvov. Um, and, and, and I thought here is something, we can never recreate that world, of course, it's gone, but we can remember it we can understand that who we are is rooted in that world. And I, for me, this was the positive way of doing it rather than traveling there to only look for what remains of your own culture, but rather to understand it was always a mix. The culture was not one or the other, they were all meshed together. And that was what made them what they were and gave them also a great deal of creativity and beauty. Uh, and 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 you bring this up in, in your book, um, showing this 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 ferment of of ideas and um, this polyphony of voices of 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 um, ideas for the future, and that that's certainly um, something that is is often uh, I think uh, forgotten because it just doesn't fit to to the stories that we we like to say to 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 each other. Um, and, and uh, what is, in, in your opinion, of the future of this relationship uh, with that particular uh, space, that the future in a sense, the sense, the, the generation of the Holocaust survivors, people that actually were from there, mm -hmm. um, is, 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 is uh, almost uh, entirely away. And then uh, we're, we're having a second generation, people that were born in Israel, and third, fourth generation, very much, very far away, in every possible way from that particular um, space. Um, do you think um, this space will be important for, for the new generations or, or, or this relationship will, will, will vanish? You know, I, th I, I think we don't know. Obviously, we can't tell. My own, and, and certainly we don't know what will happen because of this war. Uh, what will Ukraine look like after that? Uh, whether this sort of positive trend of opening up to the past, uh, warts and all, you know, uh, and, and, and trying to think of Ukraine as a space in which there were all these different cultures, all these different traditions, religions uh, that created something that you could call Ukraine. Uh, we don't know. But my, my feeling is certainly uh, thinking about people of my generation and younger people, uh, that there is in Israel for sure, and I think among, uh, I saw that among young Ukrainians, 
there is actually an interest in that past. There is a sense that we lost something, uh, that the, the terrible you know, simplifiers of the middle of the 20th century, the terrible ideologies that said either one or the other, that we have to erase things in order to build things, that we have to get rid of entire cultures, that there are people belong and people don't belong, that they Im impoverished uh, uh, our own lives. And that if we want to enrich our lives again, uh, we want to know what it was, we want to learn it, and so I, I think there is something, um, there is a hope there that people will go back. We saw obviously signs of that in Poland. Uh, and, and, you know, despite the current politics in Poland, which is leaves something to be desired, uh, there, there was Poland acted as an example for many other East European countries that had gone through this period of first communism of a particular narrative and force on everyone. And then the new nationalism that came back and refused to think about what it was and how it had acted uh, in World War II and before, there was an opening up. And I think the, 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 this energy is there, whether it will win out or not, I don't know. But I think that I, one can see many young people who do want to reach back into that past. And, and, in, and in many ways, as I say in the book, if you want to understand who you are today, uh, and if you want to understand that what we have today is not the only alternative, uh, it's not the best thing, that, that progress doesn't go you know, like that, it's not a straight line at all, uh, then it's good to look back. We can learn a lot from that, even though it's dead and gone, we can still learn a great deal and maybe um, change our own expectations for a better future. Hmm. Um, well, it, 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 it's, it's certainly, and, and you've mentioned um, the, the war in Ukraine, uh, and, and then again, uh, the, the, the borderlands uh, has become once again the, the bloodline, uh, bloodlands in, in many ways. And you know, uh, certainly until the, the the outbreak of the war, um, there would be certain certain predefined roles that would be assigned to both Poles and the Ukrainians um, in terms of the discussion about the Holocaust and the time of the war. Um, and and uh, I'm I'm just wondering how whether the war will will change that uh, in, in a sense that yes, uh, we've we've departed from those predefined roles. It's until until the outbreak of the war, Poles generally would not be recognized in the world as as um, uh, particularly open to the others and and uh, uh, keen on on helping uh, uh, refugees. Uh, and yet uh, today we are seeing uh, Poles uh, uh, and the Poland uh, state uh, opening its 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 borders and to the refugees from Ukraine. At the same time, the borders. With um, with Belarus uh, uh, for those refugees coming in from Syria and and Far East are still closed, but nevertheless, in that respect of the uneasy Polish Ukrainian uh, uh, history, um, Poles did an unusual thing. Uh, in the same way, uh, also uh, Ukrainians has been has been fighting heavily in, in many ways, um, doing unexpected thing in, in terms of the historical historical uh, facts. It's it's not. Uh, Something that that um, that historically would be would be uh, probable. So, so, so how how uh, in your uh, how do you think that this will change? The war will change the discussion. How uh, the, the the dynamic between those three groups, Jews, uh, Israelis, yeah. Poles, and Ukrainians today? Well, you know, uh, um, um, I wrote. Before the war um, uh, broke out, I, I, I wrote an, uh, an essay that is, I think is about to come out uh, very soon on the sort of triangular relationship, precisely uh, Ukrainians, Poles, and Jews, particularly Israelis. Um, and one, uh, one central theme that I wrote about was memory laws. And if you think about memory laws, then uh, 
what what happened uh, once uh, Russia attacked Ukraine could not have been expected. Uh, in 2015, Ukraine passed memory laws that uh, tried to criminalize and didn't criminalize, but at least censured uh, any criticism of the UNUPA uh, because the, the organization of Ukrainian nationalists and the Ukrainian insurgent army were presented as the great uh, liberation heroes of Ukraine and any bad thing said about them was not acceptable uh, in that law. Um, now, of course, Jews have one history with the UNUPA uh, and Poles have another. And Poland in 2018 uh, passed memory laws that said that um, um, anybody who denies that what happened in, in Wawin was, was uh, genocide, uh, well, it should be criminalized. And again, it wasn't criminalized, but it was censured. Uh, and Israel had its own set of memory laws, which were about the Nakba, about the expulsion of the Palestinians, passed at the same time. That is, let's not talk about that because you cannot talk about bad things that we did together with bad things that were done to us. Now, so you would have thought, how can Poland, Ukraine, and Israel somehow end up on the same page? So in part, this is thanks to Mr. Putin, uh, who managed to unify Ukrainians and, and managed to create a, 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 uh, a, a common space for Ukrainians and Poles. Uh, we have to remember that many East European countries, Poland, Lithuania, Latvia, many others, uh, um, once they became independent, uh, independent from communism, uh, wanted to make sure that they remain um, um, ethno-national countries, that, they, that their minorities are as small as possible. They had finally managed to become uh, nation states. Uh, Poland in the interwar period was a nation state, but only 60% of its population were ethnic Poles, and the rest were Ukrainians, Jews, Germans, Lithuanians, Belarusians, and so forth. Uh, and so the, the process in which these countries became um, uh, uh, homogeneous was one that was facilitated tragically by the communists and by the Nazis, by population, Soviet population policies and Nazi genocidal policies and mutual and ethnic cleansing as happened between Poles and Ukrainians. And these countries want, wanted and still, in fact, want to preserve that accomplishment, accomplished through uh, blood and inhumanity. But history suddenly turned differently, as it tends to do. And suddenly, Poles, I think, feel, and on the popular level, even more than the government, feel empathy for Ukrainians who are being... Uh, invaded by Russia. Uh, and so I, I think there's an opening here. There's an opening here for an understanding that we have more things in common than things that separate us. That the history of blood and resentment and hatred that we have with each other can be turned into a history of commonality in fact, we can go back to earlier periods before that kind of uh, nationalism. But we don't know because the, uh, Ukraine was in many ways between two poles. You could say between Zelensky and Poroshenko. There was a sort of ethnic nationalism that was presented more by Poroshenko and Zelensky who spoke much more and speaks much more of Ukraine as a country of many nations and cultures. And the fact that he himself is of Jewish origins, of course, uh, represents that, manifests that. Will Ukraine continue on that trajectory or not? Uh, I hope so, but we don't know. Uh, will Poland open up now as, as it has? Or will there be now growing resentment, uh, especially with an economic downturn against foreigners, people taking our jobs, people, you know, it's very hard to tell. Uh, one can only be hopeful because when you see this kind of sacrifice by people who take in Ukrainians into their homes, 
uh, one of the people on this panel and I know has done that, uh, vo volunteering to just house people in, in their own homes over a long period of time. That is something to be admired. Uh, that shows a humanity uh, that you, you did not expect when you saw these memory laws just a few years ago. Well, uh, I fully agree, uh, and, and we, we, we hope there's nothing else we can do, uh, or there are things we can do, but nevertheless, we, we, we hope that um, the war we are, will end and, and the Ukrainians will pre prevail. And yes, in this post-war um, space, um, we will finally have the heroes that we can share. Uh, we will finally have, have the stories that we all, in this jungle of, of very difficult relations, uh, we can be very proud of. Um, and as you say, that may be one of the deeds uh, of Mr. Uh, Putin. And, and before I ask the, the, the last question on my end, um, please, if you have questions to Professor Abu Bardov, please uh, write them in the chat. And, and if we have time, we will be, uh, we will be reading them out and then Professor Bardov will try to answer them. Um, but my last question is, is actually, about response in, in Israel or in, in the US on, on the book. Uh, have you had any feedback? Uh, and, and you know, you can tell us a bit about the response of, of, of the audience. Well, you know, this book uh, came out in June, so it's quite new. Uh, the reviews that I had by and large, uh, and, and it's out right now only in English, uh, I heard some rumor that it may come out in Polish too. I'm, I'm hoping that will be the case. Um, so the, the reviews I've had were only in the American and English press. They were generally um, positive. Um, um, I think people do realize that this is a very different kind of history book both because it talks about an area that few people know much about and because it does it in a somewhat different unconventional way. I can say that a lot of people were in touch with me, which is not surprising, of course, when we talk about uh, <laughs> this kind of history, uh, asking me questions about their own family. And you realize how a book that deals with a world that is long forgotten and gone, in fact, that world exists in collective uh, memories of whole communities. Uh, I spoke about the book in Germany, I spoke about it in Austria, and I got also this kind of response of people, not only Jews, but also Poles and Ukrainians, who uh, record memories that were passed on from one family to another of the world that existed where Jews, Poles, and Ukrainians had lived side by side, and how People remembered languages that were being used, remembered uh, these kind of fond family memories, pre-genocide, pre-hatred, that were actually passed on in families. And I can say that I was just, I just met a potential publisher in Israel, uh, and he said to me, I absolutely have to publish this book. I'm a Galiziana. And he showed me his entire library. You know, and this goes in his family to his father and his father's father, father. And so I think that the book evokes something which to me is very interesting as an historian because it's both a world that we forgot and it's a world that is still deeply embedded in people's collective vicarious memories and matters to them. And I'm just very glad when I get these kind of responses. It really moves me. Hmm. Uh, uh, I'm sure, and, and I'm, I'm very much uh, looking forward to the moment when, when the book will be published in Poland, because Poles, <laughs> uh, the Poles, uh, <clears throat> for us, in, in generally speaking, I think we're not aware of, of the sentiment of of uh, of the Israelis of, of of the Jews toward that particular space, and we we consider it to be our own, and I think it will be a, a very uh, um, eye opening uh, experience for many of, of of our readers to understand that those crises that Shinkevich described, uh, uh, and and so many other uh, authors that we've been longing and dreaming about. Um, 
is also a place that been filled with uh, with with the voices of of the Polish Jews and, and that uh, the others are like uh, the, the the Jews uh, from Israel or other places are also grappling with this this uneasy uh, yeah. relation. Uh, so so we very hope uh, we very hope uh, that the book will come in in, in Polish uh, soon and that would be a good reason for us to bring you to Krakow. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I do hope so as well. Um, lovely, uh, Professor. So, so I'm looking at the chat and chat, and we have uh, uh, lots of uh, positive feedback and and prizers, appraisals uh, on on the on your end. I don't see any questions um, uh, so far. Uh, I don't know if we have um, if if there are uh, questions, but if not, let me just once again. Uh, Encourage uh, to to read the book, uh, to buy the book uh, also at the Galicia Jewish Museum Bookshop uh, website. We ship the book internationally, so it may get to you mm -mm, soon enough. Um, the one question we've got is: is uh, are you working on on an, another subject, on a, on a new book already? I am. Yes, in fact, and it's in some ways it's. Uh... It's a continuation of this book, and in other ways, it's uh, very different again. So it's a continuation in the sense that, as I said, uh, Tales from the Borderlands ends with my family's transition to Palestine, to Petah Tikva, which now is like a suburb of Tel Aviv, but at the time was a separate town, um, and the difficulties of transition. Um, the book that I'm working on now is about my own generation. That is the first generation that was born after, as I say, after everything happened. Uh, there was World War II, there was the Holocaust, uh, the establishment of the State of Israel, and the expulsion of the Palestinians. Uh, and so members of my generation, born in the 1950s, were born after it all happened. Uh, and I'm interested in how that generation is linked to that place. When, you know, when I spoke with my mother uh, about her childhood, her childhood was in Buchach. My childhood was in a kibbutz and then in Tel Aviv. Uh, I went to Buchach for the first time in my 40s. Uh, and so how is it that a connection, a powerful connection link is created to a place in one generation? Uh, that's a, a question that I ask about the Jews, but I'm also asking that question about the Palestinians, those who remained in the country and who grew up in it. And while my generation were what I call the normalizers, because we were the first native Israelis born into the state, the Palestinians who remained there were born into an abnormal situation where their culture their villages, the cities they lived in, their elites were largely erased uh, out of over a million uh, Palestinians who had lived here before 1948, only 150,000 remain. And so I'm interested in how their link to the place uh, developed and changed over time. So I'm doing it through interviewing people, through speaking with people. So in a sense, the way I do it is through first-person histories. And I've interviewed well over 30 people in sort of long interviews. And I'm hoping to make that into a first-person account, what I call a personal political history. Hmm. Well, it's, it's certainly um, sure it's going to be a very difficult uh, subject because uh, it's 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 still very much influencing that the present day reality of 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 Israel, um, and uh, it's it's uh, that's why it may be a more uh, well I don't know if it's more but it's it can also be a very sensitive subject uh, and painful. Um, and again, those questions about uh, uh, the, the policy of the Israeli toward the Palestinians and the expulsion of the Palestinians versus and that's one of the questions. Uh, the expulsion of the Jews versus the expulsions of the Palestinians. These are um, difficult subjects, and, and I'm very much looking forward to reading about about that in in your book. Um, so, so before we depart, um, I'd like to to again make a, a, 
recommendation uh, of not only the Tales from the Borderland, but also the other books of Professor uh, uh, Bartov. But also, I'd like to encourage everybody to join our next programs that will be happening uh, the, the following week on December 7. Uh, we will be looking at the uh, Action Reinhardt, and we will have uh, Chris Webb and Stalin Aids from the um, Johannesburg Holocaust and Journalist Science Center talking about Belgians and Sobibur and Treblinka um, death camps. Um, and I'll post, uh, um, there's going to be also the online program. You need to register to take part in that. And then the following day, uh, on December 8, uh, here in Krakow, we're going to be organizing uh, an, a one day conference with uh, Yad Vashem on the Jewish resistance in Krakow during the um, the Holocaust during the uh, occupation. So, uh, so please stay tuned. Uh, the conference on the Jewish resistance will be on Galicia Jewish Museum um, YouTube channel. Um, so again, Professor, uh, it has been a, a huge privilege and honor uh, to spend those 50, 60 minutes uh, with you. Uh, thank you so much uh, for finding time. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. And, and before uh, I'll finish it up, I would like to also thank uh, my colleagues uh, who made this program uh, possible, uh, Ada kopecz pawlikowska uh, and Jakub um, Kotulski, as well as uh, our uh, translators, uh, Adam and uh, Siergi, um, who translated to, uh, um, to Ukrainian, Sergei Chuprina and Adam Musiał. Uh, and uh, Adam Musiał, if you may, uh, if some of you don't know, was also a translator of Professor Bartov's book uh, on uh, on previous book on Buchacz. Uh, so again, thank you so much, Professor. Have a lovely uh, evening. Have a good Shabbat uh, tomorrow evening. Uh, be well, and um, I hope to meet you next year in Jerusalem, but hopefully also in Krakow. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you all. Have a have a, a, a good day. Be safe and uh, look forward to seeing you uh, on our Zoom programs or in Krakow. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.